I think everybody knows that uh, that we're here to remember the, the life and, and the death, especially the life of, of David Mosner, who was the only Deep Springs student to be killed in action in Vietnam. I think there's, there's few enough people here that it would be nice if, if real quickly before we start, if we could just go around and let everybody uh, say their name and briefly their association with the college. That's all right. Uh, Ron, could you, could you begin? <clears throat> uh, Ron Alexander, class of 64. I was here for uh, two years when Dave was here. Uh, Ron Mortensen, uh, interim professor. Jim Bostrick, I was here 47. Donald Bickman, class of 07, senior cowboy. Ken Mitchell, work on the ranch. Karen Mitchell. No, 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 please. <laughs> Karen Mitchell, married to Ken Mitchell, um, garden manager. I'm Meredith Cobble, married to Joel, he'll tell you. <laughs> can never remember the years. <laughs> um, I'm Kelly Dunn, I'm their daughter, and married to Mark Dunn, the farm manager. I'm Paul Wiener, Deep Spring 63, and I was here about 40 years. Emily? I'm Emily. Linda, <laughs> 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 Linda Williams, uh, office. I'm Tim Matterford. I'm on my second year. I'm Steve Carver. I'm a second year. Dick Strong and I was business manager where David was there. Uh, my name is Joel Coble. I was uh, started here in 1965, so Mosner was a third year man when I got here. Yeah. Jack Newell and I uh, joined the faculty uh, when David was beginning his third year. And I came with Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Zanahara. I helped organize this along with Ron Alexander. And I want to celebrate Dave's life tonight. Uh, I'm Gabe Beckhouse. I'm a second year. Uh, Nancy Ihara. Jared Dar, second year student. Mike Zalatov, DSO4. Damon O'Connor, DSO6. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate, really, to, to give the first word to Dan Ahara. Dan and, and Ron have, I think, conceived the idea of doing this memorial and been working very hard at it. So, Dan, let me turn it over to you. Okay. <coughs> I want to thank David Nidar for being the MC for this event. And I want to say that <coughs> Randall Reed and, and, uh, I, 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 I'm atypical Parkinson, so if I trail off, let me let me know. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted. Anyway, uh, Randall Reed, former dean of Deep Springs, said today was one of the best. And Hal Sedgwick, who recently wrote me, said, it's so sad that it's been 40 years since he was killed. It makes, it makes it so vivid how young he was and how much of his life was taken away from him. That tonight, though, we want to celebrate Dave's life and sure that though it was, he, he, he passed away Actually, because of the international dateline, uh, about three, three this morning, 40 years ago. And so, this is a celebration of his life, and, and I'll turn it back over to, to David. <coughs> I, think, I think it's hard to to try to do justice to the enormity of what it means when somebody dies in, in combat, especially when it's it's uh, in something as vexed as the Vietnam War was for this for this country, and people have so many strong feelings about it in different ways. But I think that it's, it's, it's worth remembering that each of us in our own way are participants in the history of this country, and this institution, as much as we like to think of it as isolated, is also a participant in the history of this 
country and therefore is not untouched by the complications and the difficulties and the combination of idealism and, and uh, tragedy and error which, which marks, I think, probably the history of any country. Let me give you a couple of, of just facts about David's life. He was, he was born in 1946 in Syracuse, New York, to Ernest and Carolyn Mossner, and he grew up in Austin, where his father taught philosophy at the University of Texas. His fiancée wrote us that he was brought up in a household infused with rational, atheistic, and the humane spirit of David Hume, about whom his father wrote, and for whom he was named. He left Austin after high school for three years at Deep Springs, two years at Cornell, including a uh, honors English degree with a thesis on Thoreau. And then he returned to Austin for a year to go to the University of Texas Law School, but dropped out after after one semester in the realization that, that he wasn't going to be able to finish because he was he was going to get drafted anyway. <coughs> after a, a great deal of reflection on the on the contention of the war and on what ought to be his own relationship to the war and on a sort of long-term reflection on what the obligations were of a, of a citizen of the country and of a, a son of, of parents who'd been raised in this country, he, he ended up accepting the draft and not doing what so many people did who, who objected to the war as he did or who, and in fact a lot of Deep Springs, which was, which was uh, you know, finding ways to get out of the draft. But he accepted it and he went and he served. And after about four months in Vietnam, he died, stepping on a landmine in Quang Tri Province. His body was cremated on arrival in San Francisco, and his parents had a private burial ceremony. His name is inscribed on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, panel 10W, line 131. If anybody's looking. I think as, as I've been reading about David's life over the last couple of, uh, couple of weeks, there's, there's been a number of times where, where I've been moved to tears by, the, by just my own imagination of what he must have gone through and what so many other people at that time must have been going through as well. well I missed the draft by a couple of years, but it certainly was one of the major events of my life and the, and, the, and the question, I think, that was so front center for everybody and made front center for everybody by the draft, which was, what is your relationship to your country's undertakings as a citizen and as someone with an independent responsibility in a democracy to be thinking and to be using your own judgment? It turned out to be, you know, sadly for all of us, just an incredibly difficult and wrenching experience. And as I said, David, when he wrote his applications, Deep Spirit, wrote an essay on his thoughts about the obligations of a citizen to a country. And I know he never stopped thinking about them, probably right up until the time that he died. I think we're fortunate probably at this juncture that we get to that we get to take this time to remember him because because it's 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 easy to forget about the intensity of those kinds of, of experiences and inner struggles to our national life and to the lives that we all hold in common in this country, but they're never really that far away. So I'm glad that we're all here, able to come together and, and spend this time thinking about David and thinking about the, the real virtues of, of life in which he rose to the, the occasion of what, of, of what faith handed to him. Um, so to, to kind of flesh out the picture, I think is what we'll do we're going to do next. We're going to we're going to turn to uh, a graduate's postscript, which is an article that was that was written by David about by about David by one of his teachers at, at Cornell after he died. And, uh, and Ron, you're going to read that. Um, part of it, yes. Okay. Oh, David, can you stay there for a moment? Because I want to kind of present this uh, sure. picture. Yeah. You get on a wide shot here. The picture in the library of Dave um, and myself uh, is interesting, um, but I found a better picture. Um, if you 
see the humor of Dave playing the flute, which he didn't know how, and giving the finger at the same time, with me playing the piano, which I didn't know how. <laughs> so I'd like to give this photograph to uh, the college, to mount next to the photograph of uh, Dave Wasserman, smiling, courtesy of the uh, TAI project. So. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to briefly explain the photographs. I hope I only have 20 copies. Uh, I can provide more. <coughs> of course, I didn't give myself a copy, so I've got to remember what they look like. Um, the first one on the first page, um, the uh, portrait side one, uh, is, is the same picture. It's in the frame. The one next to it, uh, we're not sure if that was Dave in Vietnam or in the Army base in uh, California. Um, <laughs> the one on the next page needs some ex explanation. <clears throat> when we went uh, on a student body cruise to the Grand Canyon, I believe in the fall of uh, 65, uh, Steve Oliver got ill and needed to take the bus back to Deep Springs. So we stopped in Las Vegas at the bus depot and waited to be sure he got on the bus okay. So we had just come back from camping out at Mount Charleston and everybody in 1966 kind of looked like everybody looked like in 1967, so we were, you know, beards and, and dirty clothes and all that. So we kind of spread out on the, on the downtown strip at that time, and we were collectively rounded up by the Las Vegas police. <laughs> it didn't look like a normal tourist there. <clears throat> so that picture is of Dave talking to uh, a Las Vegas policeman about who we were. You could see in the background the uh, old 52 GMC uh, and the camper we built on the back of it. So uh, we managed to <laughs> get out of town. I remember when, when we drove out from the bus station, we drove down Las Vegas Boulevard, you know, past all the downtown <laughs> casinos, and somebody commented, they, whoever the driver was, looked out the rearview mirror and saw all of these kind of faces you know, looking out from the canvas uh, covers we had on, on the windows there. <clears throat> the other photograph is um, from TA Archives. Of, uh, Dave at the TA convention here in 68. Um, the other one on page two uh, is, one, is one I like. Uh, it was obvious I was not part of that work party. So I would take the camera up to the upper reservoir. But I always think it was a cool photograph of Dave and Randy Riley and Steve Nall. Um, and uh, the other one is, of course, the one that's in the library. Um, in, uh, on Memorial Day 2001, uh, I did an internet search for Dave Mostyn and came up with the uh, essay that David referred to called uh, a uh, graduate postscript. Um, anybody that would like copies, uh, certainly get in touch with me or, or uh, David or David Welling. <laughs> but uh, I had, uh, for a while I, I worked for the, uh, the uh, Hallmark Network in L.A. So I saw a lot. I saw a lot of Hallmark Hall of Fame programs. I thought Dave's story, based on that essay, would be a great, you know, a, a great story for them to film. Um, but they ultimately turned it down. But in this this kind of treatment that I uh, that I uh, sent to them, I quoted from uh, James Matlick's essay. He said, "In any event, as I was told." David felt his future work for peace would lack credibility if he declined to enter and take the risks of Vietnam, the war for his generation of young men coming of age. However, paradoxical, he decided his principles and dedication to peace would be better advanced if he advocated for them as a Vietnam veteran. When I emailed this essay to Jack Amit, who was here as president and kind of <laughs> vice president, uh, well, I mean, this is all Jack and Linda's. Thank you once again. And Jack, you emailed back. You said, you surely made Memorial Day 2001 a memorable one for Linda and me by sending the Matlick editorial to us today. We sat on our bench under the elms in the backyard, and I read it aloud. We both wept. His principles, perspective, and short life have Deep Springs written all over them. It makes me feel again the weight of, pre of presiding over this place 
and the potential it has when we do it right. So that was that was a special. I appreciate it. Um, I still have the notice that I received in 1970 from Randall Reed. Just a short paragraph on the old mimeograph machine. Uh, I think maybe uh, some of these already, maybe David referred to it. Um, the one line from that was uh, that Randy Reed wrote it that in 1970. The feeling of shock and loss and all of those who knew him is inescapable. He was one of our best. That defines it. Um, I didn't know what the word charisma was at the time, but if I look back and I think Dave Monster had charisma, it was out, you know, kind of expressing it. He had a natural kind of coolness that we all appreciated. <clears throat> after Dave died, he sent a letter, uh, I'm sorry, after Dave died, one of the members of his platoon sent a letter to Dave's parents in uh, Austin. Um, he said, he was a person uh, who loved life and almost everything about it. He wasn't out to hurt anyone, only seeking a better world for everyone. Um, it's a closing thought, one of my favorite quotes from my time with Dave here. In his final speech, his third year speech, uh, out there on the porch, he said, uh, after three years at Deep Springs, I'd make a pretty good first year man. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, we're going to have a number of different people speak briefly here, and uh, the next one is Joe Colville from the class of uh, 65, I believe, and, and uh, so Joel was also here when David was here. Uh, have a good um, I've got the letter that Ron mentioned uh, from, it's, I've got a copy of it here, so I didn't remember this, but one of the service, one of the other Army guys that... Uh, Mosker served with, so we're one of the last people to see him alive, which is significant. So that's uh, Roy Seaman, Specialist Force of the Fourth Class, and he sent a letter to uh, Professor Mosker and Mrs. Mosker, and they sent a copy of that back to the student body here at Deep Springs. Um, so the letter was printed in, uh, looks like it, uh, Professor Mosker worked at the University of Texas in Austin, so the the uh, letter was printed in the, looks like the Daily Texan. I have that, that um, I'm going to read the, the letter in full. It's pretty short. Actually, I'm going to read the. Yeah, I'll just read the letter in short from the, the special for Roy Salmon. Uh, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Mosner, today is an extremely sad day, not because my squad leader isn't with me anymore, but, but more importantly, because a man died. A man America can ill afford to lose. I don't say a man lightly because he was that and more to us. We should always be proud of him because we were every day. He was a person who loved life and almost everything about it. He wasn't out to hurt anyone, only seeking a better world for everyone. I know anything I say wouldn't comfort you. I can't do that because you've known Dave all your lives, and I've only known him for a few short months. Nevertheless, the sorrow is universal, believe me. It was only a few hours ago Dave and I talked about our philosophies in life, a deep and meaningful discussion. He talked about the stupidity of this war, his love for his parents and how considerate they were of him, faculty brat, etc., worrying about his father's health, returning to Texas, and of course our general philosophy about America and how we as individuals can, can, can improve the goals and love in our country, what we can do in the future. It is sorry and sad that Dave can't help anymore, but I for one won't forget some of the things that he mentioned and believed in. Mr. and Mrs. Mosner, not only will I, the squad, the platoon, both of you miss him and his ideals, but most importantly, America will miss a man of Dave's qualities. Sure, I know you are an English professor, therefore I must apologize for my poor grammar and diction. However, no matter how poorly I express myself, I do want to say we are all very sad and sorry, undoubtedly too sorry and sad for words. I can't say any more, I can't write any more, sorry, peace, please, and expect for Roy Samen. And that was 
uh, sent back to the Deep Springs student body in on roughly June 21st, 1970. So it really was written shortly after it had died. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to add a slightly lighter remark, and I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I was thinking about David. I, he was the, the, in those days. There were people who stayed a third year, so I came in knowing like absolutely totally nothing. No, no nothing about ranching, nothing about driving, nothing about cooking, nothing about anything. Uh, I was eager to be here, though. I can tell you that. I, I loved it as soon as I got here. But people like Dave Walker, who the third year guys, they're like giants. Giants and titans and heroes and miracle workers. They could do anything, they do everything, they done everything, they could teach you how to do it. And Mosner could do stuff, uh, I mean, as far as I know, he, he's, he's poetic with uh, crackers, but he's poetic with words. He's just graceful and easy. So when I got here anyway, just to put a little bit more of the, the Mosner story about how heroic he was, I, when I got here, got introduced to my room, and uh, Steve Oliver said, well, we really need you out in the field. This is after I'd been here to buck bales, or get the bales in. And I, as I recall, and I, I swear, Oliver went into Moster's room, and Moster was in bed because he'd fallen off the hay truck like a, some days before, and he had one arm in a sling, and it, it had a concussion or something. He gets up out of bed and is driving the truck while well, Oliver shows me how to buck bales. I'm driving it with, like, you know, you have to shift those guys, right? So it's one arm over here shifting, and the other, and I guess it was the other arm in a sling that he's managing to steer like this. And so that was that was my introduction to Bob. The other, the other, uh, two other cool parts. Uh, I think that I, I think that it's true that he was serious, but he all he had a very he took life very lightly, uh, in sort of a, a joyful manner. So it wasn't like he was not paying attention. He paid a lot of attention to life, but he had a certain joy and appreciation for how wacky and absurd things could be. Uh, and, and that would come out, and like with the, the flute to the ear picture, that was kind of typical. The phrase I remember, uh, the last, it wasn't his last speech, but one of the, one of the speeches that uh, had, someone asked him, you know, it was one of those great public speaking speeches where we covered every everything from the big big bang to what what was best to cook for dinner. Uh, and someone asked him, I think probably Von Quayle and asked him, well what's what's the meaning of life? And Mosner remarked something like, I've been saying life is the rubber band on the doorknob of infinity. And that was that's also a part of Mosner. It's a sad it's sad that he's not with us, but it was great that he was with us for a while. I think that uh, I think that having having spoken a little bit about the you know the tragic really complications that that, uh, that the country suffered, but that that David and his family and his friends especially suffered in this instance during this time, it's it's appropriate, as Dan pointed out, that that uh, celebrate a person's life, not just the death. And, and there are a number of uh, Dave's friends, acquaintances from, from his time at, at Deep Springs and at Telluride House have, have written some reminiscences. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read a few of the ones that, that do describe his, uh, him in life, uh, you know, aside from the, from the complications that we've been speaking about so far. And let me say for those of you who don't have programs that, uh, that what we're going to do here is, is I'm going to read some of these, share some of these with you. Uh, Linda is going to share one as well, and then we'll have an opportunity for those of you who, who knew Dave, who want to add things to, to stand up and, and contribute your reminiscences, and then we'll, we'll have uh, some, some art, artistic reflections after that. So, so here's some of the stuff that people have written in. This is from Jim Partridge. He says, Dave was, was quiet, unassuming, diffident, a gentle soul always courteous and considerate. 
His opinions were thoughtful and never mean-spirited in contrast to mine, which tended toward the spiteful and vindictive. Glenn Kaufman used the phrase, cheerful for no apparent reason. And I find that a wonderfully descriptive phrase for one of Dave's most, honor, uh, most admirable attributes. Brian Galvin writes, 40 years ago I knew David as a living and as a competent individual, a year older, somehow able to do everything asked of him better than his fellow students, although without ever giving the impression that he was actively seeking honors or recognition. David was killed in the middle phase of a senseless war, but I'm confident that his death was not in itself senseless. His life stories become integrated into the life stories of those people who were fortunate to know him. For us who have lived longer and are now facing the inevitable disabilities of old age, David Mostyn remains frozen in our memory at the age of 23, full of irony, wit, and vitality. And of course, Frozen in our memories at the age of 23, no more aware of what the future holds for him than we are now aware of our own fates. And this is from Eric Schneidevin, class of 62. <clears throat> My memories of David focus on his aspirations to be a poet. He recited his work frequently, and it seemed to contain that sense of innocent wonder that defined his personality for me. If I could use one word to describe David, it would be gentle. He was a good, kind person who offered much to a world all too short of his qualities. I felt an almost physical pain upon hearing of his death. It was not so much the event, but that a person as kind and gentle as David was taken in a violent act of war. And this is from Attributed by Bill Pizik, class of 65. says, I can't recall knowing anyone who seemed as cordial to everyone as David Mostyn. I'm convinced that he esteemed some people more and wanted to have less to do with others. But in my experience, he did not seem to put much energy into criticism of individuals, especially to third parties. I imagine this partly as courtesy, but even more, he seemed to have a gift for seeing people as individuals rather than embodiments of categories. On his way to Cornell, Dave stopped at my family home in Pennsylvania for almost a week, and we hired out as farm laborers together. After dinner in the evening, we would go for a walk and chat. I was amazed to learn that he was considering law school. I had visualized Dave as potentially one of the great writers of our generation, but it seemed as if that task intimidated him and he seemed to have trouble visualizing an appropriate day job to support it. I was worried about the Vietnam War. He did not seem to view it as a personal danger. At that time in my adolescence, I was all too ready to see people solely as embodiments of their personal political stances or as a sum of their self-interests. Day was a real teacher and a model of a different approach. He seemed to communicate well with everyone by accepting and observing who they are. Perception first, and judgment a long time after. And this is, was sent in by John, John Blackton, who, who is not Deke Springer, but who lived with, with Dave at the Cornell branch, the Telluride House. He says, in Ithaca, I wasn't a close confidant of David's, but I found, him both, I found him both interesting and engaging. As someone who knew the Cornell branch, but not Deep Springs, David seemed to me to embody what I perceived to be the spirit of Deep Springs. The Cornell branch style was loquacious. David was taciturn. Telluriders tended to form firm judgments quickly. David was reluctant to take a side on an issue until he had thought a great deal about it. We tended towards the ideological, David towards the pragmatic. One would have been ill-advised to ask most house residents to help out changing the brake drums on one's truck. One would not have hesitated to ask David to help with that task. 
Much of the Cornell branch in the 60s was enthralled to a flamboyantly charismatic Cornell faculty member who combined aspects of Oscar Wilde and Oswald Mosley to be Alan Bloom, for those of you who weren't there. David was always very measured in his response to this individual. Those of you who are so inclined are welcome to come back down to my house for a reception afterwards. Um, and at some point within the next few minutes, I think down in the VH, they're going to they're gonna ring the bell of David's memory as well. Thank you all.